Good morning. Hope you are all well. Thank you to all of you for coming here today. Uh, in the first paper, in this first paper, the Scottish Government published to renew the prospectus on independence, uh, we set out evidence showing independent countries comparable to Scotland were both wealthier and indeed fairer than the UK. We then asked the question, with all of our resources, with all of our talents as a nation, then why not Scotland? Why should we not be able to match the success of those independent countries that are both more productive and more equal than the UK? Those independent countries, they demonstrate economic dynamism and social solidarity. Every democracy, of course, quite rightly, has its battle of ideas. That's healthy. But what characterises the success of many of the countries we have looked at is that over and above the essential cut and thrust of daily democratic engagement, there is often a general consensus on what kind of nation they are or indeed what kind of nation they aspire to be. I believe in Scotland we have a similar general consensus, a belief in equality, a belief in opportunity, a belief in community, and that we are entitled to certain basic rights, rights such as the right of workers to take industrial action, the right to an adequate standard of living, the right to access a system of health care free at the point of need. That consensus building defines my political beliefs. The idea of solidarity and guaranteed rights for diverse groups of individuals is of the utmost importance to me. So uh, the paper that we are publishing today, that I am delighted to be publishing uh, today about creating a modern constitution for an independent Scotland is about that kind of Scotland that we want to see and ultimately the kind of Scotland that we want to be. It's about the issues that matter the most, not least protecting the NHS in a written constitution. And crucially, it's about people who live here, whoever they are and wherever they come from, they can help to shape that newly independent country. We will debate our proposals in the Scottish Parliament. We will, of course, engage with the public, with trade unions, with businesses and many others who make up Scottish civic society. Today's paper is about how we can build a better Scotland for everyone. So we can, we hope that it will encourage uh, and indeed uh, inform that wide ranging debate. The vision that we are outlining in today's paper, it contrasts quite starkly with a Westminster government which is taking Scotland in a very different approach, a different direction. One where, I'm afraid, rights are not protected. One where rights are being systematically eroded. The UK does not have a codified constitution, as we know. Instead, its constitutional arrangements are based on the principle that the Westminster Parliament is sovereign. This makes it a global outlier amongst modern democracies. For example, all uh, member states of the European Union have written constitutions. Not having one and relying on Westminster supremacy has real consequences. We've spent the last decade looking on as the UK government undermines constitutional principle after constitutional principle, with very little that anyone can do about challenging them or holding them to account. That would not be possible in a country with a codified written constitution that sets what the rules are, but then importantly and crucially sets out what people can do to ensure that governments and politicians adhere to them. Westminster has already been able to undermine the devolution settlement, override decisions made by an elected Scottish Parliament. In future, Westminster sovereignty, of course, could even allow the UK Parliament to repeal devolution through nothing other than a simple majority vote. That's not an abstract concept. It's worth remembering that UK government is already seriously considering the repeal of the Human Rights Act, one of the most significant achievements of any UK parliament in the last 
30 years. So all of this raises the question, why should Scotland settle for the current Westminster system rather than making different choices ourselves? With independence, Scotland could embrace the principle outlined in the claim of right for Scotland, that sovereignty lies with the people. And we could adopt a written constitution that sets out to protect key rights, key values. Governments, of course, come and go. But what a constitution built by the people can do is set out and embody a set of longer term, more fundamental values about what a country is for, how it should work. A common understanding of a nation's priorities, a standard below which no government should ever fall, and a mechanism for ensuring that these aren't just lofty words, but are meaningful rights that put power in the hands of the people who live here. Today's paper also sets out how we would create a constitution. It makes clear that after a vote for independence, the devolved Scottish Parliament would legislate on an interim constitution. After a wide process of consultation and of engagement, this interim constitution would come into force at the time of independence. Following independence, we would then develop a permanent constitution through a legally mandated constitutional convention. This process would be driven by the people. Once a draft constitution has been drawn up, it will then be considered by the Scottish Parliament but it will only come into force if the people of Scotland vote for it in a referendum. In the context of the Westminster system, these proposals do sound radical. We are, after all, planning to involve the entire country in discussions about fundamental constitutional change. But when you look beyond Westminster, you can see that our proposals are in line with steps that have been taken by nations right across the world. In the last 20 years, several countries have directly involved their citizens in designing or indeed amending their constitutions. The countries which have amended their constitutions include Ireland, include the Netherlands as just two examples. And Scotland would seek to learn from international examples. After all, a new constitution will protect and enhance the rights of every person in Scotland. It should be designed, it should be considered and it should be approved by as many people uh, in Scotland as is possible. Because of that, that, this paper cannot definitively say what will be in the permanent written constitution of an independent Scotland. That's a decision that can only be taken after independence by the people of Scotland. But today's paper gives some ideas of the prov provisions that a constitution could include like similar documents in nations around the world. We expect it would set out fundamental values, such as democracy, the sovereignty of the people, freedom, and the rule of law. It would include provisions to enhance equality, prevent discrimination. It would describe the role of some of our key institutions, such as parliament, the government, the courts. It would also contain measures on other issues which people see as being of fundamental significance and importance. It could, for example, specifically protect the right to take industrial action or recognise the rights and interests of our island communities or contain provisions on the right to adequate housing, the right of communities to own land or our right as citizens to access health care which is free at the point of need. In the Scottish Government's view, it should also include provisions stating very clearly and explicitly that Scotland will not host nuclear weapons. And many constitutions include environmental provisions. We propose that Scotland could protect the right to a healthy environment, could include sections on sustainable development, tackling the climate crisis, protecting nature. As those examples help to demonstrate the very process of creating a constitution would be energising. It's a document that will be created by the people as well as for the people. It will help us think about and describe the sort of country we want Scotland to be. And by helping to enhance and protect important rights, it will make a genuine and significant difference to people's lives. Of course, a written constitution is something that will only come about when Scotland is independent. 
when people who live in Scotland are taking the key decisions about Scotland's future. We have made so much progress as a country over these past 24 years with a, a limited measure of self-government. As a country, we are now facing a choice of two futures. One that is driven by Westminster, which is taking advantage of a Brexit Scotland didn't vote for, to erode our rights and undermine our national parliament. The alternative is for people in Scotland to take our country's future into our own hands, to embed rights we should all enjoy in a modern constitution and build the better Scotland we know is possible. Thank you, and I'm more than happy to take questions. I'll take questions uh, from the floor. We do have uh, an order in which we will go with. I will dig that out, if I may, and we'll go to Colin Mackay first at STV. This, this is something that would only happen in an independent Scotland. So you're telling us what you want to do when you get there, but you're not telling us how you're going to get there. How do you get there? Well, of course, our, uh, our preferred method, our preferred uh, option uh, for Scotland becoming an independent country is, of course, uh, that legally uh, binding, legally mandated Section 30 uh, referendum. Now, we know that Westminster has continued to deny that, continued to block that. And that's why I've said uh, repeatedly that the only way to uh, break that logjam, to break that Westminster intransigence, is through building popular support, is the popular support of the people uh, that will break that logjam. As much as I would like to give uh, STV and Colin you an exclusive, of course, you'll need to wait till the 24th uh, of June. You'll need to wait till uh, Saturday when I'm speaking uh, quite rightly first and engaging with party members uh, in Dundee where we will discuss uh, the strategy and the way forward uh, for independence. But it, I'll just reiterate and re-emphasise the point. Our position actually has never changed. Our position is that we should be independent uh, through a referendum and we have mandate after mandate after mandate for that. It is the continual denial from the Westminster government that means we are going to have to use the power of the people to break that intransigence. Here we have uh, David Lockhart from BBC. Thanks, First Minister. Um, with mortgage rates as high as they are, with people in your own party conceding that independence doesn't feel imminent, with the SNP facing internal problems, is it not a bit indulgent at the moment to be talking about the intricacies about a written constitution for an independent Scotland? And a quick supplementary, if I may, a uh, big vote potentially at Westminster today on the future of Boris Johnson, former Prime Minister. How do you hope things play out there uh, later on today? Well, on your, on your first question, I know given everything that has happened in Westminster over the last few years, this is going to be a very novel concept. But I think it's really important that politicians make good in the promises that they're elected on. And in the manifesto that we were elected on in 2021, of course, uh, we made it explicitly clear not only would we pursue another referendum on independence, but of course that we would outline uh, the vision of an independent Scotland. We would continue that uh, independence prospectus uh, that we had been working on for a number of years. So I think the second point I'd make in answer to your question is that the issue of independence is interlinked to the cost of living crisis, which is the number one issue that is, takes up my attention and undoubtedly is a priority for the people of Scotland. It is over a decade of Westminster-imposed austerity. It is a Westminster-imposed hard Brexit on Scotland that we did not vote for that has caused untold econom economic damage. It is a Westminster government's mini-budget last year that, of course, again, caused economic and causes economic strife, even though that was not a budget passed by our nation's parliament. So the issue of people's suffering is undoubtedly linked to the fact that we don't have these powers, these fiscal levers, the economic levers in our hands where we can make a better Scotland. That's why a written constitution that protects, for example, an adequate standard of living, it's not abstract. I think it's fundamental to people's lives right now. In terms of um, Boris Johnson, uh, I've been on the record and said clearly, I think, that uh, every single uh, Scottish uh, MP uh, must vote to sanction Boris Johnson. I think those that choose to turn up to the vote and abstain or indeed vote against the sanction, uh, any Scottish Tory MP that does that uh, is betraying 
the people that they represent, um, Boris Johnson and indeed the Conservative Party more generally, uh, have shown flagrant disregard for rules that many of us, most of us, of course, adhere to. And at the extreme end of that, we saw people literally missing funerals of loved ones, not being able to say goodbye while they parted in Conservative headquarters. That's a betrayal of people's trust. And any Scottish Tory MP that is going to abstain or not vote to sanction Boris Johnson, then they um, uh, rightly will face the wrath of the Scottish people at the ballot box. I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, do we have Sky TV? No, Sky, I think Kezia's not here now, so we'll move on to Peter, ITV. Thank you, First Minister. Um, the day before your first big announcement on independence as First Minister was the day that Nicola Sturgeon decided to break cover and deliver an impromptu press conference on her driveway. It also coincides with polling showing that since her arrest that the SNP is suffering in the polls and that you could lose the next election to Labour. Her own personal popularity ratings are plummeting. Um, your group response in the SNP has been you, I believe, said that either you stand by Nicola Sturgeon or you leave the party. That was what was reported. You, d you didn't say that. Did you not say that? No. You didn't say stand by Nicola uh, Sturgeon or leave the party. Okay. Well, if you doubt your question. Well, 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 I'll come back to that. Um, your group did publicly say that your response to this is, would be to send Nicola Sturgeon flowers. I don't believe that would be something that was afforded to any other backbench MSP when they found themselves in bother with the authorities. Um, I guess that there are many people who are supporters of independence are now asking, is protecting Nicola Sturgeon more of a priority for you than protecting the party and independence? For me, I've said what I've said about Nicola time and time again. You and others have asked me uh, numerous questions and on the issue uh, of how Nicola is treated, uh, I have, I hope in my uh, 12 weeks now, uh, as leader shown consistency in terms of those involved in the police uh, investigation. Uh, what I would say to you is that as leader of the SNP, I take with the utmost seriousness the trust that members have put in me to make sure that the SNP continues to be a party that is winning elections. That is exactly the strategy I have. That is exactly the motivation I have going into any election, including, of course, uh, the next uh, general uh, election. And in terms of support for independence, these, no doubting at all, Peter, the, the premise of the question that these have been difficult weeks, months for the SNP, I'm not doubting that for a second. In fact, they've probably been some of the most difficult months the SNP has faced uh, in its modern uh, political history. Despite that, support for independence is rock solid. Uh, many uh, polls showing uh, that support for independence has been above 50%, some showing perhaps just below uh, 50%, but support for independence uh, has been solid. And therefore, uh, that's why it's so important that we don't just point out Westminster's failings of, their, of, of, of that, there are, there are many, but also that what we do, as I've been trying to do uh, today in this paper, is outline a positive vision for an independent uh, Scotland. So for me, uh, the case for independence is bigger than any one person or personality, myself absolutely included. The case for independence uh, and the, uh, is predicated on a vision of an independent Scotland where the powers uh, and, the, and the future direction of this country are in the hands of the people of this country. Thanks, Peter. James? Uh, Keir Starmer's been talking in Edinburgh about um, ending oil and gas exploration in the North Sea uh, around Scotland and also about setting up an energy company in Scotland. Are you being outflanked on climate change policy? Uh, not at all. Uh, let me say that uh, I'm not sure anybody will trust a Labour Party on the green economy just two weeks after they dumped their £28 billion green prosperity fund. Why on earth should we trust uh, a Labour Party that in successive UK governments has squandered not tens but hundreds of billions of oil and gas revenue and not invested but a fraction back into Scotland? And we should somehow be thankful that they're going to set up a part of a government department if they win a general election. Well, look, uh, in Scotland, and as part of the Scottish Government, uh, we don't uh, just talk the talk, we walk the walk. We've got the track record to prove it, whether it's Scotland, whether there's tens of thousands of jobs that we have created, whether it's the uh, £500 million Just Transition Fund 
that we have committed. So for me, uh, I don't believe, and the Scottish Government has been clear on this, we don't believe in unlimited extraction of oil and gas. We don't believe that Scotland's future uh, is in continued indefinite extraction the, the North Sea. We believe that Scotland's future is absolutely in renewables and green technologies. And that's why, as I said, uh, we have not just invested uh, in the likes of the Just Transition Fund, but of course uh, set up, for example, the Scottish National Investment Bank, which is helping to unleash some of that capital that's going to be required uh, to, to boost uh, the, the green economy in the North East, but right across Scotland as well. Um, Alan from Global. Thanks. Um, just reading this stuff on defence in this proposed constitution would suggest banning nuclear weapons from an independent Scotland. Just wondering how that squares with joining NATO. Who have you spoken to within the alliance, around the alliance, that says you could impose those preconditions and still be allowed to join? Well, remember, our wording is very careful uh, that we would look to remove nuclear weapons from Scotland in a way that is, in a manner that is safe and expeditious. So we want that done as quickly as we possibly can, but safely too. We are going to be, and we continue to be, uh, at this present day and moment, uh, a responsible global uh, partner. And therefore, we would look to join NATO in the same basis that countries like the most recent entrant, Finland has. Finland has been very clear in its opposition to hosting and basing nuclear weapons on its soil. That would be the same basis upon which we would seek to join uh, NATO. What I would say is, though, we would do that in a way that, as I say, is safe, is responsible uh, as a global uh, partner. So discussions, of course, would take place with the UK government, uh, with NATO and its allies on that very point. I think the other question is going to take in the Prince of Print Huddle. I think that's our, our broadcasters uh, and uh, radio, and I think we're going to do a separate Print Huddle. So thank you very much. Uh, for coming across. I will speak to media, uh, the members of the print media uh, in just a moment's time, but thank you very much for coming across. Uh, your time is greatly valued and greatly appreciated. Thank you.